We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. My witness today is the journalist and New York Times bestselling author Tom Vanderbilt, and our topic is The Beginner's Mind. Tom is the author of a brand new book, Beginners, The Power and Pleasure of Lifelong Learning. Stuck in a midlife, mid-career and mid-competence rut, he decided to investigate what would happen if he learned a whole series of new skills and cultivated a beginner's mind. He learned chess with his four-year-old daughter. I think you can guess what happened. He takes up snowboarding, singing, surfing, drawing, taekwondo, and he makes his own wedding ring. So what drew me to this topic? Over and over again, when working with my clients, they feel that the key to the meaningful life is either a job or doing some hobby at the highest level. But what if we're all missing something when we take out the fun? Does being so focused make us one-dimensional? Could we all benefit from a beginner's mind? Tom, welcome. Thank you for being my guest. So what was the journey of playing chess together with your daughter? Well, first of all, thank you, Andrew. Pleasure to be here. And yeah, the, that journey began uh, when, as you mentioned, my daughter was four and she asked a very innocent question. Can we play a game of chess? She saw this board in a library and it was very visually appealing to her. And I thought that would be a wonderful idea because chess is, of course, reputed to be very good for the, the young mind. But I, there was just one problem in that I actually didn't really know how to play the game. Not even really. I didn't know how to play the game. I might have learned the moves a long time ago, but I'd forgotten them. So I was sort of panicked and I tried to learn quickly myself online, which was, you know, got me to a certain point, but I didn't feel that capable of, of really being a competent teacher. So I thought, well, I'll just hire a coach and just see if this chess thing sticks with her. And the first time the coach came by, I suddenly made this impromptu decision to also join the lesson, which was a bit unusual for him. He hadn't really seen that, but I thought, well, why not? Why should I sit on the sidelines when there's this thing right in front of me that I would like to learn and is someone is being taught? So I, so I joined. It was, to my mind, an interesting little experiment, two beginners at one task separated by four decades. And I was so struck by the whole experience that it opened up this, you know, I don't know what the word is. Um, a, a door. Paroxys- <laughs> well, a door, or, but it was, I was seized by this almost paroxysm of, of, of self-realization that I hadn't learned any substantive new skills in, in quite a while. And I was sort of resting on whatever laurels you might say I had professionally and, and just feeling a little bit stuck without even being aware that I was stuck. So you were effectively a subset of two about what it's like to learn. So your daughter was four, and I'm guessing you're 40-something. What was the difference between the way a four-year-old and a 40-something-year-old learns? I mean, there are many differences. I mean, there are many cognitive differences and then many lifestyle differences. On the lifestyle front, children are, of course, basically have nothing to do but learn and do so in an environment that is completely structured, completely welcoming, completely full of parents giving them positive feedback at everything they do. It's a very low pressure environment. They are encouraged to do as many things as possible and not necessarily achieve any sort of competence in, in any of them, except except for your basic life skills, like like walking or, or things like that, which they sort tying of learn shoes. on their own. Yeah, well, I mean, tying their shoes, yeah, they need help. Walking, they don't really need help. So there's that difference. Adults, you know, don't really have any of those things. Cognitively, you know, the, these are sort of a set of things going on that the, the young brain is just, again, a sort of learning machine that has yet to be fully completed. There are, there are synapses that are being formed and, and connected going on. I mean, my brain has had five decades now of things that I've learned, memories I've had, muscle memories, to use that phrase, that I've had. When I learn something new, I'm, I'm adding that on top of an already very stacked deck. My daughter, every new skill she was learning, it was like, oh, I now know three skills instead of two. So it was, she had a very fresh, this very fresh, you know, out, outlook for this thing. So that those are sort of the, some of the key differences, I think. And before very long, you stopped being part of your daughter's lessons, and you both learned in quite different ways. Now, your daughter did deliberate practice, and you did mindless repetition. So... <laughs> I have a feeling the first one's going to be better than the second one, but explain to me the difference. 
Yeah, I mean, deliberate practice is the famous thing from the psychologist Erickson about that related to the 10,000 hours rule that this is what is required at a bare minimum to achieve expert level performance in a task. And deliberate practice in the world of chess, for example, would mean playing a game, but then after you've played, whether you won or lost, analyzing that game, preferably with a coach or with some sort of instruction going on and really understanding why it was that you won or lost. My mindless repetition that I was doing was simply to play because I enjoyed the competitive you know, thing going on there. But if I won, I would feel, wow, I I'm a great chess player. If I lost, I would, I would chalk it up to sort of bad luck and then press on and play another short game. So, you know, my, anytime you basically have a, have a coach, I think you're probably engaging in some kind of deliberate practice. But th there's a, a difference here that it's worth talking about, which is that Getting back to the idea of professionals, I mean, to be an expert level performer often means to be a professional, you're being paid for something. The idea of practice is part of your job. It is not meant to be necessarily a fun exercise. So uh, Erickson in his book talked about some professional singers that they were interviewed about this and asked about their feelings, how they, how they felt while rehearsing. Joy wasn't really a part of the equation. Whereas for amateur singers who had no responsibilities at the end of the day to put on you know, some concert that paying people were going to see, but treated it much more as, as sort of a, a joyful, to them it brought pleasure. Whether it was actually the, the best pedagogical tool is another question, but I think you know, there, for someone who's not going to be an expert level performer or anywhere near an expert level performer, my question is why should we have to take it all so seriously as you hinted it in your introduction? So you and your daughter played chess together. How long before she started wiping the floor with you? It didn't take long. I mean, I'll, may, maybe I'll say a year, but what, what happened, I sort of faded away from the lessons. She kept on. She was learning pattern recognition, opening variations, strategy, tactics. I was sort of blundering on my own through playing. And once in a while, I would, I would sort of crack a book or something. Yeah, through sheer persistence, I have kept at it and I've gotten a bit better. And, and to, be, to be certain, I could, I, I could approach this whole thing in a much more methodical way and raise my rating points. You know, rating points are what we talk about in chess are kind of the end all be all. But again, I've gotten out of it what I've put into it roughly. And what, what I've gotten out of it though is some appreciation for the nuances of the game that were completely absent before, a great amount of pleasure in playing people, in sometimes beating people, sometimes losing. It just opened a world, you know, a door, as you mentioned, that that wasn't there to me before. And so when something like just for example, the recent film The Queen's Gambit that came out, which was incredibly popular, uh, this is something where chess may have seemed like a foreign language to me, but now I could actually understand it. I felt I felt sort of vindicated. I was like, yes, the world is seeing chess uh, for once here. So again, you know, I'm not on track to be anywhere even near the lowest level of a, of a FIDE, you know, master or anything like that. Not that it wouldn't be interesting, but I, I talked to one person who both has a PhD and is a chess grandmaster. And he said that becoming a chess grandmaster was a harder thing than getting the PhD. So these are the sort of stakes that are on the table. So you quickly have to decide if that's one goal, what else can you do with chess? So I, this is partially why I wrote the book is to show people that there's this entire spectrum of experience that is out there on the learning curve that is nowhere approaching expert performance, but still brings a lot of reward and, and meaning and, and just joy, I think, into people's lives. And what I found incredibly interesting reading your book is that you fell into a trap that a lot of parents fall into, and you became a chess dad. You would take your daughter to various tournaments, and then you were left twiddling your thumbs on the sidelines. What was that experience like? Time-consuming, boring, uh, you know, but sitting on a, a school floor in a basement with with no air, you know, watching kids play chess sort of has its limits. And you know, of course, I would sometimes do work then, but then it was always a weekend and then that felt a little bit defeating. So, yeah, but this is an experience that that anyone who's a parent has probably gone through of, of shepherding their child to, to any number of lessons. And I, I found myself facing a certain self-hypocrisy here where I was telling my daughter, you know, we were living this life of learning for her. And I was, I was preaching how important it was and how important to try different things. And it doesn't matter if you're the best and just giving all these messages that when I turned the mirror back on myself, I wasn't really walking that walk of the talk I was talking. So it was a moment there that another motivation for writing this book. And, and I, I decided rather than simply take her to these things, were there things that we could both learn together in concert? And this is not to say I, I wanted to completely become a domineering presence in her life and she would have, have no autonomy apart from me because this is something that, you know, I think is an issue. But when possible, it, it was a great way to sort of kill two birds with one stone. And I, I you know, developed a little motto, which was, if, if you have to take them, join them. Mm, 
I think that's a motto we should give to all parents. If you have to take them, join them. Because as adults, we're terrified of looking stupid, aren't we? We sort of feel we've got to have a basic knowledge of, give me another example of something that you did. Surfing, for example, I, you know, I was well early on in my surfing journey when my daughter decided, or I decided she wanted to do a summer surf camp in Rockaway Beach, Queens, which she really turned out to enjoy. But I found the same dynamic there, just all of these parents basically sitting on the beach, once in a while filming their kids, but often just looking at their phones. And you know, I would talk to people once in a while and I would, I would get a range of responses, but there, there was just such a, a lack of willingness to even broach the idea of, of getting in the water. And I, I would tell people, you know, they have these extra surfboards you could use. You could do a little private lesson on the side. It's a lovely warm day. <laughs> the water is right here. And I, I just found it frustrating. And I tried to explain, you know, it's not as hard as it looks. These, these are also sort of mild days at the ocean when, when the best surfers wouldn't be there. So it wasn't even the idea that so much that they would be intimidated by the skill of other surfers, because there were a lot of kids just having fun in the water. I see this often, just this, whether it comes from fear or a certain stasis or or just a, an uncertainty about the unknown that people unwilling to bridge that gap and, and people who'd be per perfectly, you know, physically capable, perhaps not mentally ready to, to take that. But yeah. so that, that was another example. I'm afraid to say, I think it's a bit of a man problem. For many years, I used to do agility classes with my dog. And this is a bit like horse of the year, but the dog runs around and you go with it. I say it's a bit like playing chess while running because you have to get your body into certain positions so that the dog follows round. So you have to think ahead and run at the same time. I did it for many years with different dogs, never at any particular level. I and mean, it was just a bit of a fun thing to do with your dog on a Monday night. But over that time, lots of men would join the club. But unless they became good, they just dropped out. Whereas the women would come along and they would enjoy themselves. And if they did well, fine. And if they didn't, it didn't really matter as long as they had a good time and the dogs had a good time. But the men had to be good. Do you think it is something to do with being a man and our expectations of ourselves? I, I think you're absolutely right. And this is something I encountered in any number of my classes that they seem to be dominated by women, particularly sort of older women. But to be willing to learn, one has to admit that they have something to learn and that they are open to this, you know, what's called intellectual humility. And I, this is... I love that word, intellectual humility. The courage to admit what you don't know. And there, there are some research on this that men, let's say, do worse on this component. I mean, men... That is the gender that brought you mansplaining. I, I need only <laughs> explain. We don't hear about women splaining, but you know. So in talking to a lot of these women, it's not like they had any less fear or about like surfing, for example. It's just that they they just seem to have more of this again willingness to learn to put themselves out there. Often doing it in groups with friends, which is another thing that unfortunately doesn't seem to shake out as well for men, as particularly as we age. The idea of groups of friends, friendships. We tend to rely on on sort of a core group of older friendships, and it's harder for men to make new friendships. And many of the instructors I would talk to, you know, would, would sort of reflect this idea back to me that, yeah, men men come in with these very strong, strict goals that, for example, with surfing, that they're going to be surfing Jaws in Maui, which is a ferocious, you know, surf break after a year. And this is something that really is, is a lifetime <laughs> progression that, that one is working on. And that that is a, a pretty unrealistic goal, not impossible maybe, but is probably only going to backfire. So that might explain some of the attrition rate that you, you mentioned where I try, and this is something that I tried to not put anything on my, make the goals pretty open-ended, pretty low stakes. The goal for me was really the learning process, not some, and I didn't have a chess rating in mind. I didn't have a singing goal in mind per se, other than to simply give it a try. So how did you decide what you were going to learn? At first, I, I solicited some some comments from friends and even on an internet chat group that I sometimes look at where you can sort of post inquiries like this. And I got a lot of interesting responses, but these were things I thought for me to do them would be, you know, it was someone else's idea. They, they weren't things I, I could I could feel an instinctual pull towards. So, but I, but I did have this kind of short list I came up with that, that were things that I wanted to sort of dabble in over the years, but had just had never found the right moment. And maybe I had even done as a child like a lot of us have, such as singing or drawing, and had sort of been gently or not so gently steered away from and never found a way to sort of get back. And, and with singing, for example, this is the classic trap where it's something that, again, that kids are encouraged to do quite freely. We don't put huge expectations that they're going to be great. 
often they are actually pretty great. Singing is sort of a natural impulse that, that we all have. I think that should be nurtured. But, you know, we're sort of steered away from that in the classroom environment. And sometimes we're actively told with singing that we can't do it when we're kids. You know, sort of go to the back of the class, don't sing so loud, Andrew. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is often, you know, someone who's been you know, after a few outings, they're sort of told this. And if you had a little bit of trouble learning to read, you, you wouldn't be just told you can't read and you're never going to read in your life. I mean, we, we just, we, we put this such that, that this, you know, performance emphasis on something like singing, rather than it being a tool of social communication that we're built to perform even before we had language, you know, it becomes this thing that's a God-given gift that only the right people can do. So, so we quickly fall out of practice. And then, I mean, the studies on this are interesting. By the time you, you reach your college age, you've already sort of lost whatever capacity for singing you had. And three times or four times a year, we're asked to you know, sing happy birthday or something like that. Or some places it's different. For example, in England, there's there's quite a bit of, of, of lusty, you know, sort of singing that goes on in football matches, for example, which which is one of those few genres of public singing that is still still out there. But I think for, for a lot of us, it becomes this sort of rarefied thing that only professionals can indulge in or, or people with talent. Long-winded answer here, but basic response though is that there were things I, I felt I wanted to do because this is going to be an important thing, motivation. If I didn't think I wanted it, I, I didn't want to learn something like coding where I felt like it was being sort of suggested on me that there was a social expectation this would be a good thing for my job, for example. I, I wanted a genuine interest. And I, I don't want to say the P word, passion, because I, I wasn't sure if it would be a passion, which I think is another thing people can get hung up on. The idea that if they start something like a pursuit, like singing or drawing, that they have to go all in and go to the top and it has to be a passion. I, I think it's okay to to stop things, to quit things. You, you don't know ahead of time what something's actually going to be like. So this is yet another trap I think we should avoid that you're going to have this one passion with a capital P. One of the things I think that stops a lot of people is this idea that old dogs can't learn new tricks. Now, as somebody who's tried to learn an awful lot of new tricks, what would you say to that famous phrase? That it's untrue. I think a lot of us have this idea in mind of perfection of, of this 10,000 hours goal of reaching the highest levels in some sort of pursuit. Uh, you know, it, Yes, it, it would be a very difficult thing for me to become a chess grandmaster, perhaps almost impossible being a parent, having a full-time job and being 52. This would be an almost impossible quest, yes. But there, again, that, that's just the highest level. There are a lot of things that I can pick up that any of us can. And why actually have to go for the highest level? Why can't we say there's something in there that we can use from it, we can learn from it, and we can have fun? I mean, what is this obsession with having to be good? Yeah, and it's something that is trickling down already into this, you know, I was talking before about this golden age of youth learning where you were expected to be able to try any number of things and give them up after six weeks or not be good at them. But we've seen that obviously creeping down in, into those worlds as well, where children are having these performance burdens placed on them, where they are dropping out of youth sports because it's too competitive. We saw in the United States the whole scandal with people faking resumes in sports like lacrosse. So their children would get into elite level colleges. I mean, sort of where does it end there? But, you know, I, I met so many interesting people in, in the course of doing this book. Just for example, one guy, a guy named Steve in New York City, who was in his 80s and was trying to learn to juggle. And he wanted to get to five balls, which is a very hard thing to do. It, it takes sort of like a year. If you're amazing, it might take less time, but it, it's a very hard thing to do. It really requires a lot of practice. But already in learning to juggle three or four balls as someone of that age, this was already such an achievement. And it, one thing that interests me in, in doing this book was that I, I found that you could have these small moments of improvement that really felt meaningful. I mean, something like juggling three balls, it sounds ridiculous, but if you go into a crowded room and ask who here can juggle three balls, not that many people will, will raise their hand, maybe less than you would think. So just by taking on this one little thing, he had this moment of, of growth at an age when, let's be honest, growth is not often in people's front of their mind. But it's also incredibly important because this is actually keeping, one, his mind active. And number two, it's actually keeping his dexterous skills up. You know, my father is 90 and he spent the last few years giving things up. And that feels incredibly sad. 
it would be wonderful if actually at 80, we were learning new things. Yes. I mean, something like juggling, a week's worth of learning to juggle is shown in studies to produce significant changes in neuroplasticity, even at age 81. So it's still there, that ability to rework the muscles of, of the brain to, to reshape based on an activity. And the problem with older people and, and skill learning is that, yeah, the, the fear becomes more intense. There might actually be physical limitations, but a lot of people sort of seem to go out of their way to avoid learning new things. And, and it sets in motion this non-virtuous cycle that ends up making their situation actually worse cognitively and developmentally, because I'm afraid of this new iPhone, just to, to give some example. And so, so they'll sort of avoid that and only use their old landline. Oh, I recognize that one. <laughs> well, you know, you see entire groups of people doing this or even being hostile to new information and only watching a certain news channel, for example, and just not, not having that openness to experience. This is the term that psychologists use, and it's one of these big five of the, of the personality factors that seem to sort of define who you are. So let's think about the beginner's mind. What do we need to have a beginner's mind? To be liberated from the burden of expertise and experience. So how, how do you do that except for going back in time and being a child again? But I think one of the most powerful and, and easily approachable ways is to simply try to learn a new skill. And skill could also extend to something like language or even a field of study, I, I think, because it's, again, activating. You're plunging into something where you have no pre-existing knowledge. What I like about skills is that it's not just your, your brain having to do this new work, having to have this beginner's mind, but it's also generally your body. And I found a very potent combination in doing something like jewelry making, where I really found this interesting connection going on between my fingers and my brain. And it, it seemed like a two-way connection, that my brain was learning from my fingers as much as my fingers were learning from my brain or, or being told what to do. In all these pursuits, I really felt like I was experiencing beginner's mind. I mean, I, I had a vague sense of some of these things just from people who had done them, but something like learning to draw what the actual experience was, was really nothing like I thought it was. And it just opened me up to a new world that was not new people, new tools that I had to purchase, new ways of using my hand, new ways of using my eyes, and kind of going through this almost rebirth, not not to get too sort of metaphysical about it, but, you know, that kind of starting at, at, at the zero on the learning curve just, just felt to me very regenerative and, and, and powerful. And again, without necessarily having to achieve mastery, I, I found that, that any growth, and, and not even so much the growth, but just again, getting back to that zero state was strangely exhilarating. And I would imagine that it was very good for you because you're like me. I write as well. You know, I sit there and tap a keyboard all day long. I'm using my brain. I'm not really using my body. Whereas with these things, you were getting your body to do new things. That feels quite important to get the body moving in a different kind of way and coordinate in a different type of way. Did you find that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because I felt like on, on the information front as a journalist, I sort of had that covered. It's not, not that I'm not learning something new every day, but that whole process of learning is very familiar to me. And, and as is the process of writing, apart from doing, you know, haiku or free verse or some novel form, I, I'm not going to experience the, the pain of learning a new skill through writing. It's just, I've, I've done it too much. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not learning in that regard. But with a skill like juggling, I could actually feel my brain hurting. Is it's the only word I can think to describe it. And and then the funny thing would be, I would work on something for a while, juggling three balls, and I, I would get it, and I would be doing 40 or 50 cycles in a row. And then the teacher would say, okay, now start with your right hand. And suddenly there was my brain hurting again. And, and that was when the learning moment was happening. And sort of like doing physical exercise, when you start a new exercise regime, you're using your muscles in new ways. So you, you will have some new forms of pain during the first weeks of that exercise, and then you'll gradually condition into that. And I think the same thing happens with, with learning. So you know, most of these skills I was taking on, there, there were always new plateaus to sort of reach. So I felt like I wasn't ever stagnating. And there were, there were always ways I could make my brain hurt again if I, wanted, if, if I wanted to. And in your research, you found that beginners all make the same mistakes. Tell me about that. With motor skills, the key thing I think that beginners do is that they're too focused on their own body. And this is a quite natural thing to do if, if you're out in the ocean trying to stand up on this flimsy piece of styrofoam as a wave is bearing down on you, you're going to, you know, panic and, and sort of look, for example, at your feet on the board and make sure you're actually standing on the board. And you might then fixate on the nose of the surfboard. The problem with this is that 
it sort of triggers this set of actions that because you're looking at the front of the surfboard, you subconsciously emphasize your, your body forward and you push down a little bit and the surfboard will tend to nose dive, as they call it. And it's not a fun thing to happen. So a beginner driver, for example, learning to drive looks at the front of the car, which is an extension of their body. So it's sort of like looking at themselves. You know, through time and, and practice and, and gaining of, of capability, we start to look at other places. We make automatic some of these motions and we can sort of fixate on other things, which is tremendously useful. The, the whole thing with motor skills is that the more you actually think about them, the worse you perform them. And just think of the last time you went walking, I'm sure you didn't give a thought to how you were walking. And if you did, you would probably start to walk a little bit strangely. So <laughs> walking being the ultimate skills that we've all mastered. So it's a bit like cycling in the sense that I've now moved to Berlin. So I had to learn two new sets of skills. I had to learn German or I'm still learning German. I'm just having to accept the fact that to my dying day, I will be doing German and trying to improve it. I did learn it when I was 13 to 16, and that's a wonderful foundation. But the other thing that I had to do again was cycling because it's a very flat city, it's a very small city, and you can really get around well on a bicycle. And I hadn't actually ridden a bicycle for 40 years, something like that. But you like never that. forget, right? <laughs> but you don't forget, but my gosh, are you self-conscious when you get on that bicycle the first time? You raise a great point there with bicycling and just as another way to demonstrate the, the hardwiredness of skills. It's not really something I, I went on at length in the book, but as an experiment, I met a person who was a rocket scientist actually and had an interesting bike that many people have probably seen at something like a carnival. It's a bike that when you steer left, it actually has been engineered so that it turns right. Ooh. which is kind of a nonsensical thing. But as a, a very experienced cyclist myself, when presented with this challenge of riding this contraption, I thought, well, I know how to ride a bike, so I can figure this thing out. In fact, that knowledge of knowing how to ride a regular bike quite well made it even harder. <laughs> and the person who was trying to show me how to do this, it had taken him six months to learn. And it sounds like such a minor adjustment, but it really recalibrates your, you have to recalibrate your entire body and, and your, your mind and your sense of balance. And People were giving me all these tips like, well, just cross your hands and, and put your right hand on the left handlebar. <laughs> Things that sound good in theory, but actually do, do not help at all. So just the skills that we're so good at, we, we actually really tend to forget how good we are at them. And, and again, to have this beginner's mind, to have your body go through this period of clumsiness is, is not something that a lot of us face as we get older. And you know, some people encounter it sort of unwillingly, uh, stroke victims, for example, who have to relearn how to walk. This is where the trouble is, as I mentioned, you know, if we think about walking, this creates trouble. And these stroke victims, they know in their mind how to walk, but they're, they're having trouble convincing their muscles to do the right thing. And, and the mere thinking about it adds this pressure. The theory is called reinvestment. It simply makes it harder. At some point, you want to step out of the way and the brain wants to go onto autopilot, but that, that gets difficult. So of all the things you learned as a beginner, is there anything you're going to stick with? I mean, I really have tried to stick with all of the things. Some some are a little bit sort of easier and more convenient. And whether it's that or the fact that I really like those things the most is an open question. But for example, singing is something I probably do the most of uh, on an average week because, you know, it requires no special equipment. You can do it wherever, in the shower, in the car, uh, on the street, if you're so inclined. And it does bring me great pleasure. And it, even practicing singing to the extent that I, I practice it nowadays, uh, you know, with, with warm up drills or just scales or things like that, e even that I find to be such a almost sort of therapeutic exercise that just makes the body feel good, uh, sort of meditative or something like that. So it, it's great to find something you're trying to learn where the practice is, is as rewarding as the actual performance. And what did you learn about yourself from doing this book? Well, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say that I'm any sort of, you know, master learner or, or, or polymath or, or anything like that. I think I'm just, you know, sort of average in, in many regards, like many people are perhaps. So, you know, I, I don't think you need to have any sort of special dispensation to, to take up various things. And I, and I do think the more the better. But, you know, I, I found that I think a lot of people often think that something like a hobby or a pursuit or, or this thing must be prompted by some lack in one's life that their job isn't satisfying or they feel unhappy. And before going to this book, I, I had, certainly had nothing to complain about. I had no deep sources of unhappiness and I love my job. And 
this can be off, often the problem, though, is that you become so obsessed with your job that you, you, you never see the, the need or the desire for to do anything but that job. So it, it wasn't until I actually started doing these things that I felt I realized what I had been missing. And I, I think it also, for me and, and perhaps for other people that, that do this, is that we often tend to think of ourselves as fixed beings. Psychologist Daniel Gilbert has called this the end of history illusion, where we, we think we are now the people we are going to be 10 years from now, which really isn't generally true. So I, I found this exercise particularly useful in, in just reframing my self-identity and, and, and you know, o- opening these doors, showing that there were other facets to my personality, to my skill set, to my life. And, and it, it really o- opened up so many things, uh, new sorts of new, new friends, new things to think about, new skills, new things to do with my daughter, my wife. Uh, so I just sometimes I'll, I'll be talking about this and, and, and thinking it sounds so completely obvious, yet I, I feel like there are people like myself before I started this that just weren't quite taking this advice on, on board for whatever yeah. reason. And people like myself, you know, I've always wanted to learn to paint, for example, but I just keep on putting it off and putting it off. Well, I'm 61, you know, how much longer am I going to put this off for? And I think that's a problem that we sort of think we've got to be good at it. We've got to really throw ourselves into it. And actually, you can just have fun with it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, uh, painting, I think, is is sort of like a lot of writers say, you know, I I have a novel in the drawer or I I want to write a novel. And of course, sometimes just the act of saying I want to do something just allows you to put it off indefinitely. And or, or, or we might hold it in sort of this this high esteem where it, it seems remote and, and rarefied that, oh, it's this thing I'm going to take on someday, where I, I think the best thing is, is really just find a class as quickly as possible and just, just show up. And then, because, yeah, I, I was like you, where I would, oh, surfing, I'd like to get to that someday. And it seemed like this impossible r- remote thing when, in fact, there was a surf break 45 minutes from my house that was unbeknownst to me. I, I sort of had in mind, you know, I had to be in Hawaii or, or something. And I, I made it into this vision that was was simply too abstract and, and too highfalutin, for lack of a better word. And so I, I think sometimes just plunging in and, and just doing it, does, it doesn't have to be pretty, you don't have to be great, but just, just start. I think your motto that if you're going to take your child to it, do it yourself as well. I think that's another motto to to throw in as as well. Yeah, and that's motivation as well. I mean, sometimes that is just the biggest hurdle. I mean, making making the first call, getting in, getting through the door. And children are great that way because as a parent, you sort of feel obligated to many parents do it to to have them do things. You don't want your child just inside all day, you know, or you feel a responsibility to to show them the world. So, you know, why why not do the same for yourself? The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. And visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So we've had a letter sent in by somebody. Remember, if you would like to do the same, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, and I could be reading out your letter. I feel that I've fulfilled my mission in life. I brought up my three children, two are at university, and one will be cross fingers there soon. And it seems like I'm facing a big black hole. I'm in my early 50s. What next? I've spent so long thinking about what other people want, my children, my husband, my mother, that I have really no idea what I want. The few things I've come up with, like traveling, seem more of a distraction than a way to live or simply impractical. I have an okay job. It's interesting, but no more than something that pays the bills. I think like a lot of people who listen to your podcast, I suppose I'm looking for a purpose or something meaningful, but I have no idea where to start or even what questions to ask myself. So what are your thoughts, Tom? Well, it's something I'll say that I I heard a version of this quite often from people that were engaged in the various things I was engaged in. For example, surfing, I met people who were going through a divorce or overcoming some other personal life hurdle. And that question of identity came up a lot as well in in that, you know, I've been this person for X number of years. I want something for myself. 
in this sort of act of surfing, which I think the goal was, you know, we can think about surfing as a verb. They, they were surfing. They wanted to become a surfer. They wanted to go from that verb to a noun. And I think that itself has a certain certain meaning there. But you know, the, per, the person mentioned things might seem like more of a distraction than having meaning. And I, I would be careful not to, uh, there might be things that seem like distractions that may actually turn out to be very meaningful or, or purposeful. Something like surfing, you know, on the one hand does seem like a very indulgent recreational activity, but talking to a lot of people at the end of the day, I found it really wasn't about the surfing. I mean, yes, surfing is amazing. It puts you in tune with, with nature, with your, your body, but it, it was, it was an arena in which they were working out other things and, and deriving meaning. In terms of offering other advice, you know, I, I think everyone must have some little short list of, of things in their in their head, or or even just whims or ideas of things they've once wanted to to try, and, and just go with sort of a gut level consideration of, of what those things are, and not worry about what they are, or whether someone might think it's frivolous, or uh, and just and just and just try. And I, I mean, I, I agree that something like travel can you know, sort of done the wrong way, be just a way to seek meaning where in sort of an artificial way, rather than actually getting at the root of some of the things that, that are troubling you. I mean, that said, there what, what I found over the past few years, particularly in doing some of these skills, is that traveling to go learn something has, has been sort of an amazing combination for, mm. for me. Give me an example when you've traveled and learned something. Well, a, a surf camp would be, you know, one, for example, but I'm trying to think of some, some other things. So there was a painting class that happened in Maine because I'm admittedly a restless person at, at this age and I, I can't sort of go to a beach and basically sit there. I need to be sort of doing something. And I, But I feel like that doing something engages you in so many ways, yet you still have the leisure component, but you're meeting new people, you're engaging in a new skill, you're in a new place. And I have this long list of uh, internet bookmarks of, of classes I would like to take that include everything from stone cutting in England. It's sort of just, just these like workshops and, and things. That I, I think that that's can be a, a nice way to get both that sense of novelty that the travel brings. And, and yet also you sort of come back having learned something, which is to my mind, sort of the, the best souvenir of all. And I think that the most important thing is seeing the meaningful life not as a destination where you have to know where you're going for, a goal that you're aiming for, like, I don't know, building a monastery in the Himalayas, because then immediately, as soon as you've got the monastery in the Himalayas as your goal, and you can't get planning permission for your monastery, then you're stuffed. But actually, if you see it as a journey, and it doesn't really matter where you start the journey, as long as you actually bring something new into your life. So, Stone cutting in England sounds like a perfectly good place to start. Just go for a whim, just something that you would like to do. You know, I'm sitting here at this precise moment. I'd like to learn to paint. I don't think it's going to be the gateway to the meaningful life, but who knows? Because you don't know until you start. I think that Tom's idea of actually combining the travel with a bit of learning seems to me like a, a particularly good idea if that's what you like travel. You know, what is it about the travel in particular that you like? Burrow down into it and begin to see what it is. Is it the new places? Is it that you like to go into a particular kind of place? You know, if it is old churches, then maybe you want to study more about old churches. I don't know, but look deeper into those whims that you have and experiment. Yeah, and if I could just add one thing to that, it reminds me of, you know, I think it's often very difficult to simply put these ideas up in the air, put them on a, on a whiteboard, like a list of, uh, oh, this is what I will do that will bring me meaning. This this will be my passion. And there's a, an interesting line of thought in the book uh, Range by David Epstein, which is, which is a, very, a very good book, very similar in, in, in spirit, let's say, to mine, which is about the dangers of specialization and about being a broad-minded person. He's sort of looking at it more from a career perspective, but there's there's a line, we discover the possibilities by doing, by trying new activities, building new networks, finding new role models. We learn who we are in practice, not in theory. So that's why you know, I think, like you say, better to just jump into painting and see what it will do for you rather than to present it as the thing that's going to change your life uh, ahead of time. Because just as we're, we're not sure who we're going to be in 10 years from now, 
a lot of people have changed their entire lives taking a simple weekend painting class, ended up changing their careers, moving. I mean, so you, you never know where revelation is going to come from. I love that. We learn who we are in practice rather than theory. I'll put the details of that book and obviously all the details about Tom's book in the show notes. If you like those sort of Malcolm Gladwell sort of kind of books where you have lots of interesting anecdotes and thoughts, I think you'll enjoy this book. And Malcolm even recommends it himself. So that's a a really good accolade. Thank you for being my guest on The Meaningful Life. In a moment, we're going to look back at the interview and see what we've both learned from it. And Tom is going to share with me three things he knows to be true. Um, You can get all that extra material if you join our supporters circle, and we'll be having more details about that in a moment. But as you've been my witness on The Meaningful Life, I have to ask you the important question, what makes your life meaningful? Wow, that, I could write an entire book perhaps, but usually when I write a book, it's because I don't know the answer to something. So, you know, I mean, I mean, listen, I have my, I have my, let's say, bulwarks of identity that a lot of people have. I have my career, my role as a, as a husband and father. I think these are sort of the pillars of what gets me up in the morning. And, and, and those are very powerful things. But I think there's also this, this other thing, which I'll, you know, could just call the X factor. I mean, there's, there's always, I've always felt the desire for, for just something else, for pushing forward a little bit more, for having that feeling of, of wanting more than is comfortable. That's the mm. wrong way to say it, but pushing beyond the comfort zone a, a little bit. Not, Testing I, 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 yourself. Well, I, I often feel a little bit impatient when I find myself cast into a certain role where even as a writer, well, okay, I did this book, so your next book should be sort of a continuation of that first book. And I think, well, no, that, that sounds boring. I, I, I guess, there's, and I don't, I don't know where that, that impulse comes from to sort of play against expectation. I, I often just enjoy branching into these new sorts of possibilities, these, these new selves, and while, while still having this core of my identity. So maybe it just comes from a fear of stasis of, of not, you know, fear of death. I'm not sure what, what the, what the impulse is, but whether it's, you know, meaning, I'm, I'm not sure, but it, it is something that, that also motivates me through the course of the day, sort of like the question of, of what's next, which makes me sound like I have a very, you know, short attention span or something, which is probably true, but just kind of a forward looking questing spirit. I think that I find animates me. Well, thank you very much for being my witness today. That's where the conversation ends. In a moment, if you're a supporter, you can join us in uh, our sort of post-match analysis. Thank you, Tom, for being my guest today. Thank you. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.